welcome to Surrender School. All right. So today what we're going to be doing are steps, uh, kind of a review of steps six and seven. And what I did to go along with that uh, in the video is probably the most comprehensive day uh, video of all the stuff because it's all of the different uh, types and their uh, passion, fixation, <laughs> you know, pretty much everything that we know so far about the different types. So um, one of the things, if we have time, once we've gone through this, if we have time, I might go back by the types that are interested in doing that and covering that again with more explanation if you want it, if I have it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in this. So with that in mind, um, this is a personal journey, not intended to teach you the Enneagram, but certainly make you curious. And I think what's happening is most people are very curious and then they go do additional research, which is the whole point, uh, or at least part of the point. Uh, but it's, it's goal, really, the goal of this class is to help you recognize the wonderful person that you are so that you can relax into your true self where the God of your understanding resides. And that way you can live step 11, right? You can basically have that conscious contact with God. How we do that is by recognizing the unseen forces that drive our behaviors, which are the passions. Those are basically what in a program we call the defects. Uh, and then also the fixations, which are the stories we tell ourselves to uh, make our defects palatable to us. And then we keep them as a result of that. Uh, we catch ourselves in the act as the ego causes us to act out our persistent defects. And then we gently remind ourselves to return to our true shining self. And what happens is we we live in our true shining self more and more, not constantly, can't, we're human, but we live in that more and more all the time. All right. Keep in mind, I am not an expert on anything. Recovery is a process, not an event. As a matter of fact, there, there may be events in it, but it is not an event. Uh, Self-contempt stops spiritual growth. I learned this and from a lot of the shares, I think other people have as well. The answer almost to everything, uh, it's as if your higher power, my higher power said, uh, you can hate yourself or you can grow spiritually, but you can't do both. You choose which one you'd like and I'll wait. Uh, so, uh, and so to me, my spiritual growth, I grow by leaps and bounds is what it feels like compared to the way I used to grow. And that's because uh, my self-contempt um, and once again, I don't view it as self-hatred for me. I, 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 I know what hatred is and it wasn't that, but it was just this kind of contemptuous feeling about myself, this, you know, that critical parent that some of the people talk about is like, me, 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 right. Okay. That, that has to be quiet. I'm not going to listen to you. Thank you for your input. I'm, I'm ignoring you. <laughs> right. Which, and as an eight, I can absolutely say that even to people. <laughs> okay. And, uh, here's the other thing you get out what you put in. This is not an indictment. This isn't saying, you know, shame on you. You only get out. No, it's the truth. It's the way the world works. Don't beat yourself up at all. You know how much time you have and how much energy you have, psychic and otherwise, to be able to put into this. Just realize that what you put into it is what you get out of it. And it's okay. If you put in very little, you get very little, but maybe that's where you are in your life. And that's good, right? If you put a lot into it, trust me, you'll get a lot out of it. It's the way life works, actually. Okay, so all office hours, reading rooms, and uh, pretty much everything is in the 8529962. I call it the 5735 meeting number because those are the last four numbers. So um, Monday through Thursday sessions all on this uh, and also Michael Naylor's uh, Alchemy Mondays also here. So pretty much everything is on this number uh, and it simplifies things. I know uh, Friendly Circle Berlin has done that like forever and it works really nicely. So, uh, and right now it's working that way for us as well. Okay. Two minute shares on last week's assignment. One of the things during, um, during the office hours on Thursday, somebody brought up that I hadn't last week, I hadn't done anything about the theme songs or anything about the songs throughout our life. And so it was a really lively, wonderful discussion on songs that have meant things to us throughout our life um, that basically for different times of our life. And somebody even talked about the uh, how cool it would be to have the ability to go back. I'm going to say this wrong, but basically the ability to go back and say, what was happening in my life that attracted to me, me to that type of music, whatever that music was, what was, what was it at the time? Uh, because 
not only do we change, but the world changes as well. And what is what is acceptable back then maybe isn't now and vice versa, right? So things change. But it was a really cool discussion on on what was it about different songs that attracted us to those songs. So I'd like, I really, I'm going to stop sharing because I'd like to see if anybody wants to share on that. There were some really, uh, really cool shares, I thought, uh, on that during office hours. So I'm going to give you a second. I'm going to tell a story um, uh, about music in my life. And I shared this on Thursday when I was share, I want to share it with the group as well. I talk a lot about my husband and I laughingly say, because he's a five, he would like die or kill me probably if he knew I talked about him as much as I do. But um, so uh, I was raised by a bunch of my aunts and uncles were all like World War II era people. And um, so they were that one of the things that everybody did during that time was dance. So when I was a little kid in the early 60s, uh, they would shove all the furniture off out of the parlor and at my aunt's house and we would all dance. So I learned to foxtrot uh, Charleston, like all the dances that they did during World War II, which is really cool, right? My husband did not have a life like that. So uh, when we were getting married, I knew that he did not dance at all. And I, it was okay with me. I was fine. That was cool. Uh, so we are at our wedding reception and the song Three Times a Lady comes on, which is just beautiful, right? And I'm, I look over there because of course I'm in charge of everything. And I look over there and I'm like, what the hell? You're not supposed to have a bride. Because he's like, this is the bride and groom dance. And I'm looking, I look over there and I'm like, what the hell? And my husband beckons to me and I'm like, okay. And I go out and he waltzes with me. It was beautiful. He took dancing lessons as my wedding present. So that song, and I don't know, I don't even, can't even tell you what the words are to it, but it's like, and I have the blessing of being married to him for 43 years. Good man. So that song will always mean something to me. There's other songs throughout my life that are just right. It's really funny because nowadays, sometimes I'll listen to, um, like the words from, and I, and I said to my husband the other day, I'm like, how come all the songs are about sex? He goes, cause they're written for teenagers. Of course they're all about sex. <laughs> they're just a little more bold today, but back then it was all about sex too. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know? <laughs> so anyway, all right. So now does anybody, now that you've had a chance, hopefully to think about it a little bit, did anybody want to share on a song or songs? And it can be the theme song of who your true self is, but also, and I'd never thought of doing this until at the office hours, somebody was talking about that. And I thought, that is a that is a lovely idea. Like, you know, that could be just a study all by itself throughout your life, what songs were important to you and why, right? Because it was where you were at the time. And, and one of the things that happened that people were talking about is art and dance and singing and music and all that. Basically, it talks to the soul of us, that true self of us, right? That's basically trying to come out all the time. All right. So in addition to that, we did um, the type challenges for the weekly wrap up. And um, I don't know how many of you uh, actually like watched the video <clears throat> or watched it again, if you've seen it before. But this is the one where I say, uh, what would happen if you believed this and then you journal or meditate on it? And so it was things, uh, I'll read the type eight, right? What if I believed that control is an illusion? What if I believe that God's view is broader and deeper than mine can be? Uh, what if, uh, what happens if, what happens if I just let others do the work? Or what if I slow down and let others catch up before I make a decision? So those are things that the type eight, right, probably, I mean, I probably do the opposite. I'm not sure that I do anymore, but I certainly used to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing again. And I want to do a quick call out uh, about Michael Naylor's book and the book study. So Michael Naylor wrote this book. He has, you know, 30 years plus of experience as a counselor, as a, as a psychologist psychologist or whatever, working with addicted men, mostly men, not all men, although the title says men, it's not all men. But uh, he, so he has 30 years of experience working with them. And he also has more than 30 years as an Enneagram uh, person. So he really, I mean, his depth of knowledge is amazing. And the book itself really goes into, uh, he tells the story of these people, and but it's from the perspective of as a counselor working with them, 
what are you what are you watching for in right which for me when i read it it's like it it added an extra layer of me being able to see blind spots that i have about my eightness right and so i i have i'm i'm reading it along like as part of i'll read it like the nine before he does the i guess he'll He's starting in, in chapter four in October, so the one. And I'm reading it along with him rather than reading it. I've read the nine in the intro, the first three chapters. But I really want, I want to read it and have it very fresh in my mind and then have him go ahead and do his presentation because the, his level of knowledge and kindness and wisdom, and he's like a very healthy four. And it's amazing to spend time with him, I have to say. So I really want to encourage everybody, if you can, to get the book, The Alchemy of, Tr of Transformation. Of the the alchemy of the enneagram in transforming addiction is the name of the book. That is what it looks like, and uh, anyway, it is uh, absolutely astounding to read. And uh, and just like Helen said, when I read the eight, there's so much there's a, a depth there because of the stories that are there. Uh, and anyway, so please, if you get a chance to do that, you do want to. We're doing a book study here, and Michael Naylor is the one who, the author is the one who is holding the book study. So, uh, which we're very excited about. Thank you. And I wanna just do a quick lesson again on the instincts. So what Liz is talking about, those instincts, self-preservation, social. And once again, I think in the fourth session, um, self-preservation is a kind of a withdrawing instinct. Uh, social is a connecting instinct and, um, uh, the sexual or one-to-one -one pushes into the world. We have all three instincts. Absolutely. Right. That's the, that's basically sexual is the procreation instinct. We have that, right. We have the survival instinct. Of course we have that. Are we wound to survive? And we have the need for community. We are born with all three of those. Our types do not change. However, which of the instincts we're using do change according to circumstances, certainly. And when we're young, there is one that is very dominant. Before program, there's one that's very dominant and one that we completely ignore. But what happens is we work our program, right? As we work a program, those kind of even out. And so now if you test it, you'll see that all three of those instincts are pretty near each other, right? Unless something's out of whack. And the out of whack part means, and this is basically where a lot of our growth comes from, is we learn to tone down that made the the instinct that is the dominant one, and we bring up the and start using the instinct that is the one that we've repressed all those years. So we end up, if you've been through program and you've been years in program, you don't know that's what you're working on, but that's what you're working on, and so the instincts end up there. So you will change, maybe not what's dominant, but how much it's dominant that will change over time. What will not change is your type. Your type will always be your type. You're born that way. And your ego structure is built according to what your true self type is, right? And we just know that. I mean, it's it's one of those things. Uh, this is when people say, well, isn't that kind of putting me in a box? It's like, no, you're already in the fucking box. This The work here is to get you out of the box, to basically give you some freedom. Uh, recognize you're in a box and then you can get free. So anyway, that's what, sorry about the F1. Well, I'm not really sorry. <laughs> I sound sorry. Don't I sound sorry? I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyway, the envy that when when fours are healthy, envy will always be part of your wiring. You're you are wired that way. That's the way fours are wired. But the envy for a healthy four, the most it ever is, is, oh, I wish I had that. It's never wishing that someone else didn't. Right. Because sometimes when you hear envy, it's almost like that, that feeling that, you know, where you see all these mean girls doing shit on these TV shows. It's like, no, that's not what we're talking about. Envy literally is, oh, you see someone else who is happy and you wish that you could be there as well. And that really, and once again, that has to do with health. The health of the four uh, may always look over there, rejoice with those people, but also wish they had it, right? That's what healthy fours look like. So I think that's good. And then I think, uh, yeah, this whole idea. I, I want to. I do want to say one other thing, and that is, I am delighted, beyond delighted, that people are rewriting these to make them relevant to you. That's exactly what is supposed to happen. And I look at that and go, yes, that means you're getting to know yourself, and you are rewriting that so that you can actually answer a question that has meaning to you. And that delights me beyond. I can't even tell you how much that delights me. So, okay, cool. Right. Yeah. So the the four is tied to the basically has arrows to the one and two. Uh, people's mm -hmm. idea of it used to be there it was very clear right they would say that your the 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 area of growth right is the 
the, the arrow that points to you, right? So in other words, the two points to the eight and my area of growth is to the two. Now they're saying, uh, they're, the, the kind of the thinking on that is changing a little saying that both of those are accessible to you. And so if you're not even, you don't know anything about the Enneagram, you've just been working a program, you are going to be able to incorporate the good and bad of the two wings on either side of you and also the two arrows. So, right. Um, one of the other things that Russ Hudson said is that the, the, the forward arrow, which for me is a five is where you go under stress that people still do believe you will go there under stress. Also, that's another view of that. Uh, and so you go under like growth to one and under stress to the other, but you go at the same level you are. So it's like I I go to five under stress, but I don't go drop down to a five that you know digs a hole and hides in it. I don't do that. I go at the same level I am. I just happen to know that I need time alone, and I I take time alone. So uh, to me that was very comforting to hear that that I'm not going to end up being you know the Unabomber or something because I go to five right. So uh, not that the, you know I don't know what type the Unabomber was. I have no idea. <laughs> Nor do I care. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share. They're all like, well, we had a lecture on the Unabomber today. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen again. I came to program believing that I, and, and so all of us have all the types. And, and so, and eights, I think, are probably very opinionated just generally. But I believe not only that I was supposed to have an opinion on everything, I believe that I needed to express that opinion to everybody. So well, part of my 12-step program was to, or early on, my was to, work to, I mean, my work was like on all this stuff. And, and in the end, I know now looking back, it's just feeling compassion, but I got to where I would not state my opinion. That was the first thing that happened. And then over time, uh, and I would say, I don't have an opinion on that. And I can remember the moment that I actually, there was something that happened that I didn't have an opinion on. And I was like, I don't have an opinion. on that. It was awesome. So I do think that is something that you can grow through. And you know what, what replaces it is compassion. I can feel compassion for these people, right? I can, I can feel, I, so last night we're watching television and my brother is one of these people that talks, talks, talks uh, all the time during, um, he talks like during TV shows and movies and shit like that. So I never go to a movie with him. And I was like, can, I'm trying to listen, right? I said this, right? So then I apologize this morning because it was more important that I'm with him than I'm watching this stupid movie that I could back up and watch again when he's gone gone or whatever. But I realized, okay, and I did have an opinion on that. So now it's like, you know what, I don't get to hold on my husband. Can you guys hear the music in the background? It's Beach Boys. <laughs> okay, well, good. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I have a, a theme in the background. Okay, anyway, so I do think it is possible to outgrow that. And most of it is just what replaces judgment, because we all have that judgment and whatever, what replaces that is compassion. And I think the Enneagram helps us with that because we see, oh, I see. And I, I've said this before. It's like, I realized, oh, that person's afraid. And I said it, oh, you're afraid. And they said, no, I'm not, right? So it's like, don't say it to them. But yes, that's usually what it is, something like that. So thank you for that question, Liz. All right, so what I want to talk about now real quick, I'm not. we're not going to share on this right now, but um, you may want to journal on this. If you replace, we're entirely ready to have God remove these instead of defects of character, it ends up being defenses and humbly asked him to remove the areas that I've fallen short. So defects become defenses, shortcomings be become where we've fallen short. Didn't do something we should have done. Didn't do it as well. I could have done it like that. Um, and then the question that maybe you journal on or think about or meditate on is if this is what you were saying, because I, I, for me, it made a huge difference to shape defenses be because I truly, I, I don't think I was ever ready to even admit that these were defects. What? Def that I'm defective, right? One goes to be the belief that they're defective, very harmful for them to stay there. Uh, but we're entirely ready to have these. These are defenses. This is my ego structure built these defenses up and I am so ready for those to be gone. So anyway, give this some thought. I want to cover, um, we talked about that already. I want to talk about wake up calls. We have just a few minutes left. So I want to cover the wake up calls. And wake up calls are when this is something when I talk about catching yourself in the act, this is catching yourself in the act. Um, this is like one of the first things you will see as this type that lets you know you're slipping down in health. You're going, you're basically dropping down in that health 
right? You have that pin that sits and then it's the rubber band that stretches both directions. So you have one area, right? Most of us are going to sit in three or four. We're kind of right in there. And then we can go up and in, in basically to two and one and we can drop down to four and five or sometimes even six. Most of us don't drop into the unhealthy. Um, you just usually don't if you worked a program, right? Although you can probably picture when you did when you were young and not working a program. So this is this lets you know that that rubber band is stretching downward, right? You're slipping downward. And this is by type. This is something to notice and go, ooh, that's happening. I don't want that to happen, right? Okay, so let me cover it here real quick. For the one, when they start to believe that they're the only one who cares, I'm the only one who cares. Nobody else cares. I'm the only one who cares. If you catch yourself doing that, right, that is that is that slipping downward. That's the wake up call for the one, one of the wake up calls for the one, right? For the two, when they go out to others to win them over, they go out and like they're doing things for people that the people can do themselves, but they're in there and, they're, and their goal is to win them over. When they catch themselves doing that, it means you're slipping down. You're sli you're doesn't mean you're dropping all the way to the bottom. It just means ooh, catch yourself there because this is a wake up call that says, oh, ooh, that's behavior I don't want to do. That's past behavior. I don't want to do that. Right. That this is part, all part of step 10. Right. Living clean. All right. Uh, when threes turn on showtime mode, they start bragging and talking about all the wonderful things they've done in their past or the wonderful things they're working on now or how wonderful their kids are or whatever. When they turn on showtime mode, uh, that means that there's a, a there's a slippage there. And all this, by the way, the slipping is always caused by some discomfort that we feel. There's something that just happened, right? And that's usually what you go, okay, what just happened and why is this here? And people earlier were talking about, you see this and go, oh, what, what's going on? And that's how you catch yourself in the act, right? And these are the wake-up calls that say, because sometimes we don't even see this, but if we notice this, I think that's kind of cool to be able to do that. For the four, when the four starts curating your moves, okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna define what I think that they mean by curate. Um, so a, a museum has 10,000 items that they could put out and the, the curator for the museum goes and picks the 100 items that they're actually gonna put out and the others aren't there. So curating moods means I have, fours have a lot of different moods that they can be in and they will pick the moods that they wanna be in and they stay in their head and keep that going, whatever that is. They keep it going instead of saying, pause, this isn't where I want to be, right? So watch for that This because I, I think it seems like the curating moods comes before the being in your head and staying there, that you're picking that. And, and once again, this isn't an indictment in any way saying, you know, you're a horrible person and you pick this. It's not that. When you catch yourself curating moods, I thought that was an interesting phrase way to way word that this is all from the wisdom of the enneagram by the way um for the fives when they lose contact with people and sometimes even lose contact with reality and they spend a lot of time alone in their heads okay for the six um uh, they the for the six it's yes but thinking they're kind of listening to what somebody else is saying but they say yes yes but and then usually something negative or they're overthinking things right they're just basically making that list of all the horrible things that could possibly happen Okay, for the seven, um, they are, sevens can be very fun and very present, but they can also, the slipping down is because they're missing the moment. They're, they're, they, they basically pitch, and it's usually into the future, pitch themselves somewhere else and they miss this specific moment. For the eight, uh, use too much energy, come out with too much energy. I can catch myself in that usually now. Uh, I don't do it as much as I used to, but yeah, pin their ears back is what I would teach a class and these people are like blown away. And so I'm, I mean, way more than I do now, <laughs> which you probably don't believe, but it's true. Okay. And um, for the nine, their wake up call is they catch themselves, right? With the, they are unable to say no, right? No is, no is a complete sentence. No gets an answer. I mean, right. But they catch themselves not being able to say no. So I'm going to stop sharing. So jot down yours and let's, uh, let's go ahead and share on this. Is thinking and feeling gets all tied up in that for the six. That's why uh, sometimes rather than just a gratitude list is a physical something you do that makes you grateful. So add, add that body piece to that. I heard that somewhere on one of those sessions that I went to where they're like that the, the th when the thinking and feeling gets all wound together, which it does in all of us in some form or other, is the physical piece is the piece that's missing 
And that's what can get us out of that. And I thought that was just a fascinating thought. I, I'm probably saying it wrong, but <laughs> anyway, I thought, oh, okay, I, I understand. I think I'll use that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will say, so years ago, I studied um, something called Awaken the Giant Within, Anthony Robbins. And um, I realized that all the memories from my wedding are still in my head. And so during meditation, I will do not only the first dance with my husband, but other dances. And I'm seeing cousins. And we had a giant wedding um, outside. And then it rained, of course, which of course it did. So anyway, I hear that's luck. I, they say it's the Jewish tradition, and I'm not Jewish, but the Jewish tradition is that if it rains on your wedding day, and I'm like, well, what if it rains on you? Like, because <laughs> you're outside when the rain, I guess it's good. It must be lucky. Anyway, but so I can sit and picture like all the people that are there and all the conversations that I had, because it's all still in my head. Can I do it now? I don't know. This was probably 25 years ago that I did this, but it was such a blessing that it's all there. It's a matter of pulling it up. Who knew? I don't know if it'd still be there now. I'm kind of old, but <laughs> you never know. Thank you for that, Christy. That Yeah, I love that. I think that's a great idea. And and that's a great reminder on sevens that you're with, almost with anybody, right? Just enjoy the day, right? Sometimes it's the shit that goes wrong that's the most, that's the funniest, right? The coolest stuff of all. All right. Anybody else want to share? I have we a question. Uh-huh. Go ahead, Deb understand the four um i understood all of the others and that, that happens to me so much like when you're going over stuff it's like the four is the one that doesn't make sense like can you explain it one more time yeah i uh, think so so yeah so some of it i think the curating the mood means that you are selecting like okay so so first of all um the fours have a myriad of emotional responses to things right mm -hmm. now I, and once again, Deb, when I am talking about the four, it's 100% observing because I don't have a link to the four or the three or the six. So all mm -hmm. of those, I mean, I could be like off on all of them because the other ones I felt and I'm, they're kind of part of me, but the four isn't. So my observation is that fours have a myriad of feelings, right? So, so when, when the psychologists do the list of the 150, it's probably not that it's 40 feelings or whatever. They've got all the lists there. I'm like, yeah, I know love. I know hatred. I know uh, anger. Okay. There they are. <laughs> all right. <laughs> now I know compassion circle that Cheryl. Right. But all 40 belong to the fours. They have all of them and they can identify them. Usually if they have any kind of program at all, they can identify them. Curating means you're picking the ones that you are putting in front of you now. So you can pick to stay angry. You can pick, right? That's usually one, especially the sexual fours, do, they hate the fact that they're angry, but can do nothing about it. When they're not recovered at all, they are quick to anger. And then they feel ashamed of the anger. They don't want the anger to be there. So what happens is when you curate moods, it means that you're taking some of those and you're aware that they're there, but you bury them because you, that is not acceptable to me. I would not put that out in the, in the museum. That is not one I want people to see at all. And so that the wake up call is when you are curating that you're picking that and hiding that even from yourself. Notice that that's what the curating means. The other one is just okay. basically this idea, right? That you get in your head and it just, you're sitting here watching yourself act out in a way you don't want to act out. You're seeing it. You're you're staying in that, right? And so so some of it says this is a wake up call. Now what to do about the wake up call? I can't even help you with that because it's like it's not like you're even choosing to do that. It's just that it's there and you don't know how to interrupt it. All of us have something like that and that's what this is talking about. So any suggestions on how that it gets interrupted? I think what Melissa what you were saying earlier is you basically just say there is this thing between us and I want to talk about it. And usually if you're with a type that doesn't like to talk about it, <laughs> that in and of itself is difficult, right? But um, anyway, so uh, ideas, yeah. Thanks for recovering with us. <laughs>